as you're aware, we start taking that first tutorial this afternoon, uh, tomorrow, some of you Wednesday morning, and so today's lecture, again, will be fairly straightforward and traditional. There's a piece of it that is taught, I think, better than at, at Stanford, but uh, we'll let you see if you think that. We're going to talk about equivalent resistance today. In other words, when you take your stereo and you hook it up to a battery or some power supply, that battery doesn't really care about all the details of the stereo, how it's all wired and everything. It just cares how much current is going to go through the battery. And, and so we find that we can replace that whole messy stereo with one single resistor that we, we call the equivalent resistance. And if we do that, we get the same current through the battery that we would have gotten had we hooked the stereo. And that's what we'll talk about today. And remember, resistance is futile. You will learn this. Last day, we learned that nearly everything can be solved with this equation. B equals R. And if I look at this example, <laughs> now, remember I told you it takes about 30,000 volts to punch a spark through one centimeter of dry air. And if you look up there, you see quite a few more centimeters than one. And so if you try to calculate, uh, just what the voltage is there, sure you find that it's at least hundreds of millions of volts. Now why did that arc move up as you watched it? Why did it uh, start to float up? It heats up the air. Yeah, you have uh, this ionized path that this huge amount of current is flowing through and that's heating up the air. And as that air gets hotter, warmer, it rises bringing the ionized path with it. Okay. Now, before we uh, go to the new material. Let's just talk about where we've been. We found that when we measure the voltage across a 12 volt battery, lo and behold, we get 12 volts. But volt is just a fancy way of saying <coughs> joules for each coulomb. And the fact that we get a positive 12 volts or 12 joules for each coulomb when we measure from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, what that suggests is that the battery is delivering energy to each coulomb. And it does that chemically. It takes that coulomb and gives it a higher electric potential energy. Now that electric potential energy is just like being at the top of a cliff for a boulder. The boulder doesn't want to be at the top of the cliff. The boulder wants to be at the bottom of the cliff. And you just give it a little nudge, and sure enough, that's where it goes, all on its onesies, okay? Now, the same thing is true with this charge. The battery lifts it up to the top of the cliff by giving it this huge uh, electric potential energy, uh, 12 volts, and then it or 12 joules, and then it finds its way back to the bottom of the cliff by going through the circuit. Now, if we measure the voltage across from C to D, and remember we're measuring a voltage difference, we find that we get a negative value, negative 12 joules for each coulomb. And we interpret that as the energy being lost. But in truth, energy is not lost just electric potential energy is lost. It's converted into heat. As those charges are pushing their way through the filament of the bulb, which is hard to get through, it causes the filament to heat up. Now, if you've ever made or shaped a horseshoe, you know that you put that in the fire and it eventually gets so hot that it, it glows red. 
If you use a bellows and you get the fire really, really hot, you can get that horseshoe hot enough that it'll glow white. And that's what's happening in the filament of your bowl. The, uh, the current passing through it is making it so hot that it glows white. Now, this is the cartoon that I want you to have in your head. And people, just as an aside, that's what physics is. It's a whole bunch of cartoons. Some people think of physics as a whole bunch of equations. They don't do very well in physics. Physicists that do well have cartoons in our head. One cartoon for every idea. And those cartoons help us to make the idea simple. This is the cartoon that I carry around in my head. I'd like to share it with you. Um, each of those uh, circles there represents one coulomb of charge. The darker the circle, the higher the electric potential energy. And you see that as those charges go around, they just take energy that's delivered to them by the battery and they dump it off at the filament of the bulb and then they go back for more. But the current doesn't get used up. The current is the flow of dump trucks, not the flow of energy. It's the flow of coulombs that makes up the current, the electric current. And so that means that if I put an ammeter to measure that current at those two locations, I would get exactly the same reading on both of those ammeters. And I say it this way, what goes around comes around. It just keeps on going. It just keeps on going. So the current that goes through the battery is the same as the current that goes through the bulb and everywhere else in that simple circuit. Now, this equation can be used locally If I use it locally, then the voltage difference from any point A to any point B is equal to the current that flows from A to B times the resistance that is contained in the path from A to B. Now, what I'd like to talk about today is using this same equation globally. <coughs> B equals IR. And if I use this equation globally, this voltage here is the voltage of the battery. This current here is the current through the battery. Now, what goes around comes around, so this is the same current everywhere in that simple circuit. If you look at the homework problems at the end of the chapter, you're going to see that very quickly we're going to get to some complicated circuits with more than one branch, with more than one path. And the only place where all the current comes together in one location is through the battery. Now this R here is going to be the resistance, the total resistance, we call it the equivalent resistance. of the circuit. And that's what we're trying to discover today. That's what we're going to talk about today. Now, the first thing we need to establish yet again, you know the correct answer. What is constant for a battery? Is it voltage, current, or both? We all know the right answer. We had the discussion on Friday. Just tell me that you remember. Okay. Good. The answer is voltage. Okay. If a battery promises to deliver six volts, 
That's what stays constant if it's an ideal battery. And we're always going to assume ideal battery. Uh, rechargeable batteries are the most ideal that we have in everyday life. Uh, alkaline batteries are the least ideal. So supposing we have an ideal 6 volt battery, if I hook that up to a small resistance, I get a huge current. If I hook that up to a larger resistance, I get a smaller current. But that current through the battery is given by V equals IR. And in this simple circuit, the resistance of the circuit is this resistance. We don't worry about the resistance of the wires. What you're going to find in tutorial today or tomorrow is that the resistance of a bulb is huge compared to that of a wire, a connecting wire. Now, because of that, we typically ignore or neglect the resistance of the wires. And the wires you'll be using in tutorial this week are pretty good wires. They're pretty fat. They're pretty hefty. Now, across the hall from your tutorial room, there's a room with a bunch of turtles in it. We call it the turtle room. And in that, in that room, we train future elementary school teachers. We have a class that is laboratory-based. And in one of the drawers in there, deep in a corner, down at the bottom, hidden away from view, is a whole great big huge mess of wires, a big spaghetti ball of wires. What happened is many years ago, a teacher who was trained as a biologist ordered a whole bunch of wires so that we could learn about circuits. And she was trying to save some money, so she got the cheapest ones she could find. They're really, really thin. And what we found was that they had almost as much resistance as the bulbs. Now, I wasn't allowed to throw them out because we had paid a whole bunch of your tuition money for them. And so the next best thing I could think of to do with them was hide them. And I have hidden them now for 15 years. I continue to hide them every semester. Um, so in our class, we're going to have good wires. We're going to assume that the resistance of those wires is negligible or zero. Okay. Now, here's the big idea. If we look at some messy circuit like a stereo, um, and we hook it to a battery, as far as our friend the battery is concerned, all he cares about is if there's a small resistance out there, a lot of current flows through me. If there's a big resistance out there, a trickle flows through me. Not very much. But the battery really doesn't care about all the details. Okay? And so, for the purposes of knowing how much current will flow through the battery, we can replace that whole messy stereo with just one single resistor that we call the equivalent resistance. Now, calculating that equivalent resistance can be a little bit tricky. Suppose you have a 3 volt battery and it's measured to be delivering a total current of a tenth of an amp. What is the value of the equivalent resistance that it's hooked to? And we don't care about the details, we don't care about what kind of device it is or how messy it is. Just what would be the equivalent resistance, a single resistance resistor that we could get the same current for. Point three. Point, point three? 30. Or 30. 30. Yeah, remember, the operational definition of resistance is how many volts I would have to put across something to get one whole amp. Well, if three volts gives me a tenth of an amp, it would take 30 ohms to get one amp. So if I take 3 and divide by 0.1, I get 30 ohms. Now this might be made up of 200 different resistors that are hooked up in a very complicated way. But at the end of the day, as far as the battery is concerned, it just looks like 30 ohms. Just looks like 30 ohms. 
Now, the simplest way we can add resistors, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about this summary slide. Any combination of resistors, no matter how complicated, can always be replaced by a single equivalent resistance that will produce the same current through the battery. Uh, that makes sense? Okay, now we can talk about the simplest case, and that's the case when we're adding things in series. And in this case, I'm adding two resistors that are identical. I don't know, maybe both of them is 20 ohms. Put, put a number to it. Well, to see what that is in equivalent resistance, I can think of one of my <coughs> electrons that's trying to make this path. Let's take an electron, paint them green, call them Fred. Well, Fred has to go through this 20 ohms, and then once he's fought his way through that 20 ohms, he's got, his fight, he's got to fight his way through the other 20 ohms. He's got to go through both. And so that's the equivalent of 2R, of 40 ohms. Now, if we think of it in terms of the straws, we got two identical straws end to end. It makes it twice as hard to blow air through. If we think of it in terms of this uh, set of cylinders, by putting two resistors end to end in series, I'm doubling the length. I can think of this as one resistor that's twice as long, and that's going to give me twice the resistance. Okay? I have to fight through both. Now, if I've got a 5 and a 10, it's not a big leap to say, hey, that's just a 15. I've got to go through both of them. And in general, I just add up all the resistances. Now let's think about the ammeter. Remember, we, we add the ammeter to the circuit in series. And so if I were to draw this as a circuit diagram, there's my battery, there's my ammeter, there's my bulb, and so the resistance of this circuit, whoops, the resistance of this circuit, spelled with a C, would be the resistance of the ammeter plus the resistance of the bulb. Right? Now we don't want the ammeter to affect anything in this circuit very much. We want it to measure, but we don't want it to change. We don't want it to change the current through the battery. We don't want it to change the current through the bulb. And so what does that tell me about the resistance of this ammeter? Zero. It's negligible. It, it's close to zero. This acts, for all intents and purposes, like a wire, as far as the resistance is concerned. <coughs> it gives us information like a wire would not, but resistance-wise, it has the same resistance as just a wire. Negligible. Okay? Now, just to see if you're getting this, What's the current through that battery with your neighbor? What is the current through that battery? Seven is the correct answer. Let's do it together. Since those three resistors are in series, I just add them up. Fred's got to go through all three of them, and so that's a total resistance of 18 ohms. 
using V equals IR, I can solve for I. And I'm going to get I is equal to 12 over 18, or 2 thirds, or 0.67 amps. See if your neighbor followed that, please. Do a buddy check. Quick buddy check. Okay. Folks, now it gets weird. Okay? Up until now it's been trivial. Now it's going to get weird. My experience has been that some of you are going to just space off. Oh, man, that's, that's too weird. I don't want to deal with this. If you decide to take a nap now, you're going to be fighting uphill until the next one. Yes, you will. Okay? It is really, really important that you, you know, again, a third of you are paying attention, a third of you are thinking random thoughts, a third of you are thinking sex. Two thirds of you got to pay attention, okay? We got to get you focused on this because it's not trivial. What is the current through the battery now? Well, to answer this question, we have to ask a related question, and that is what is the current in each of these six ohm resistors compared to the current of a single six ohm resistor? If I just had one of these, what would the current through this 6 ohm resistor be? And now with two of them, would that change the current through that resistor? Now to answer that question, I've got a little demo here. I have a single bowl connected to a battery through an ammeter. And as I close this switch to add another bowl in parallel to it, you'll notice two things. First of all, this bowl didn't change. That's the way you would like your house to be wired. When you turn on your, your kitchen light, you don't want your, your light in your family room to dim. You want them to be independent of each other. And so I don't get any change here. Look at the current through the battery. What happens to the current through the battery when I close that switch? It gets bigger. It gets bigger by a factor of two. Okay? Now, what that tells me is that the current through that path right there doesn't depend on this path being in existence. Are we in agreement there from what you just saw? Yes? yes? Say yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. That means I can get rid of it. So V equals R. How much current is going down that path? Two amps. Two amps. V equals R. Two times six is twelve. Now, if I put that path back, I can't see why Fred would want to choose this path over that path. They look the same. And remember, Fred's not alone. He's got a bunch of friends, friends that are with him. And they divide up. And if the two paths look identical, there's no reason why more than half would choose one of the paths. They're going to split 50-50, so that means I'm going to get two amps down that path as well. Now, the question is, what do I got to bring in if I'm going to split it for two and two? Now, instead of amps, that's kind of abstract. Let's think of it in terms of something that flows. Blueberry juice. It's blue, okay? Let's suppose that I'm delivering two quarts of blueberry juice every hour down this path. And I'm also delivering two quarts of blueberry juice every hour down this path. How many quarts of blueberry juice do I have to bring to the junction every hour? Four. 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 Okay. Now, remember, the battery just don't care. It doesn't care what you got down there. It just cares what flows through the battery. What equivalent resistance does this battery see when it looks out and sees those two sixes in parallel? Three. If I use V equals IR, 
That gives me three ohms. That means the two sixes looks like a three. Now wait a minute, Greg. I was fine when you said add them up, because more resistance is more resistance. But now you're saying that if I had two sixes, that looks like a three. What if I had three sixes in parallel? What would that look like? A two. What if I had six sixes in parallel? That would look like a one. Wow. The more resistances that I add, the less resistance I've got in the circuit. That doesn't make sense. Or does it? <laughs> Suppose we're in this room, the doors are shut, and someone yells fire. It's not a smart thing to do. It's, I think, illegal. But that's the only door that's unlocked. And we're all fighting to get through that door. Some of us are going to win. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we open these other doors, is that going to make it easier for current to flow? Current being us getting out of the, the room? Or is it going to make it harder for current to flow? Easier. 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 Well, what if one of those paths isn't really very good? What if, in, in addition to opening that door and that door, there's a trap door that opens up here and a, a rope falls down? Is that going to make it easier or harder to get people out of this room? It's not a good path. But we can still go out the same doors that we had before. There's a new opportunity to flow that didn't exist before. It might be a hard one. Maybe that only this gentleman here with the muscles can, can do it. Okay. Any new path lowers the resistance. Now, folks, when I was alive, when I was your age, Disneyland was brand new. It was just, oh, wow. And back then, you couldn't just go on any ride you wanted. They gave you a ticket book. And there were A tickets and B tickets and C tickets and D tickets and E tickets. Have you ever heard the phrase, oh, that's an E ticket ride? An E ticket ride was the very best. That was the Matterhorn. And you only got two of those E tickets, and you treasured them. And if you could steal one from your little brother, you did. <laughs> okay? Now, back then, the newest ride was the Jungle Bear Jamboree. Now you can't, you can't talk kids into going to the Jungle Bear Jamboree today. They say, oh no, no dad, <laughs> no way. But back then, it was the hottest thing. They had mechanical bears that could sing and dance. It was amazing. <laughs> but there was only one set of bears. And when they got done with their performance, we had to get out of the room so new people could get in, because there was a line clear across Disneyland to see those bears. Now, the way they did it is they had eight doors to get us out of there, and eight doors to get us in there. Were the eight doors in series or parallel? In parallel, if they were in series, I'd still be there watching the bears. It'd take me that long to get out. If they're in series, you have to go through each door. But if they're in parallel, you pick a door, you pick a door, everyone picks a door, we're out. It's like lanes in a freeway. The more lanes you have, the easier it is to get traffic through Los Angeles. Okay, now, here's another way of thinking of it. If I put two resistors side by side, I'm increasing by two, I'm doubling, the area through which the current can travel. Since the area is in the basement, doubling the area cuts the resistance in half. That's like taking those two straws, putting them side by side and blowing through them. It's easy to get the air to go through those straws because now it acts like a big fat straw. Okay, now here's the rule. When two identical resistors are in parallel, the equivalent resistance that you replace them with is R over 2. The more general rule is if you've got N paths that are identical, you take the resistance of one path, you divide by N. Let's say I had five paths, and each path had 100 ohms on it. Five identical paths, each has 100 ohms. 
What equivalent resistance would I have? What single resistor could I replace that whole mess with? 20 ohms. 20 ohms. They take the 100 ohms of one path, you divide by five, because five paths are five times easier than one path, if they're all the same. If they're all the same. Now folks, here's where we ramp it up a lot. This rule only works when all the paths are identical. What about when they're not? When they're not, I have to be tricky. Suppose that along this wall, I had a whole bunch of drawers. And in the first drawer, I just had one ohm resistors. And the second drawer just had two ohm resistors. And the third drawer, three ohm resistors, all the way up to infinity. And I wanted to make this circuit. But I could only open one drawer. And let's say that I had to make that circuit by adding identical resistors in parallel. <coughs> they all have to be the same. Now once you open a drawer, you can take as many as you want, as many as you need out of the drawer, but you can only open one drawer, and you've got to make that. Which drawer do you open? Talk to your neighbor. Talk to your neighbor. Which drawer do you open? your hand. Which drawer are you going to open? Where are you, brave soul? 30 the 30 ohm drawer. That's exactly right. And why did you choose the 30 ohm drawer? Okay. The lowest common denominator is the way we say that in math talk. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> in other words, I can make a 5 out of 30s. I can make a 6 out of 30s. How many 30s would it take to make a 6? Five. 5, right? Because 5 paths are 5 times easier than 1 path. So this would look like the resistance of 1 path, that's 30 ohms, divided by the number of paths, that looks like a 6 ohm resistor. If I wanted to make a 5 ohm resistor, how many 30s would I take? out of that drawer? Six. Because six paths are six times easier, and that, if I take 30 ohms and divide by six, I get five ohms. Now, if I take the five and I put it next to the six, what that looks like is one, two, three, four, five, that's my 6 ohm, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that's my 5 ohm, and each of these is 30. Now I can calculate the resistance using that rule that only worked for identical paths. The resistance equivalent would be the resistance of one path divided by the number of paths. I've got 5 plus 6 is 11. And that's going to give me 2.9 ohms. Now I want you to notice that 2.9 is less than 5. And that will always, always, every stinking time be the case. When you have parallel paths, the equivalent resistance is going to be less than the least. Less than the least resistant path. 
Because let's look at it from Fred's point of view. If Fred wants to get through this, Fred could just go through the five, right? And be back to the battery. He could just go through the five. Or there's another opportunity for floor, flow. There's another door open. That reduces the resistance from the one path, the lowest path. Now, if you had gone to Stanford and taken this class, they would have derived a formula that looked like this. If you have two resistors, R1, in parallel with R2, one over the equivalent resistance is equal to one over R1 plus one over R2. How many of you were taught that in a science class somewhere? Raise your hand. Do you remember where that came from? Neither do I. Neither do I. Okay? I could derive it if I needed to, but I don't need to. Because if, if my R1 is 5 and my R2 is 6, then this is going to be 1 over 5 plus 1 over 6. When I'm adding fractions, what's the first thing I do? Lowest common multiple. Lowest common denominator, is that what we call it? Um, I try not to hang out in the math department. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, I just don't want their geekiness to wear off on me. <laughs> don't tell them I said so. Man. So the lowest common denominator here is 30. So this is the same as 6 over 30. This is the same as 5 over 30. And when I add that, now I can add that. That's 11 over 30. But that's 1 over the equivalent resistance. That means the equivalent resistance is going to be 30 ohms, the resistance of one path, divided by the number of paths, 11. Isn't that beautiful? Suddenly you see where that silly <laughs> equation comes from. You're replacing the 5 and the 6 by a whole bunch of resistors in parallel that are the same because you have a rule for resistors that are the same. Six paths is six times easier than one path. 20 paths is 20 times easier than one path if they're the same. Check the two neighbors on the bus, people. <laughs> Now, with this formula, let me write it again. This formula will be on the front page of your exam. With this formula, let's go back and look at the voltmeter. When I use a voltmeter, I connect it in parallel because I'm really measuring the voltage difference from A to B. So I choose a point A, I choose a point B, I take the leads of the voltmeter and I connect it to, um, to those locations, okay? Now, again, by connecting it, I did not change the brightness of the bulb. I did not significantly change the circuit at all. If I want to add something in parallel, and I don't want it to significantly affect the circuit, do I want it to be a large resistance or a small resistance? A large resistance, because if this is the if this is the voltmeter, and if it had infinite resistance, plug in your calculator, 1 over infinity. What do you get? Zero. And so suddenly it drops out of the equation. It doesn't add anything to the equivalent resistance. So when I'm adding a voltmeter, I want this voltmeter, I want it to be a huge resistance. That's what allows me to take a voltmeter and hook it directly across the battery. I didn't melt my voltmeter. 
Can I do that with an ammeter that acts like a wire? <laughs> no, no. If you take an ammeter and hook it directly across the battery, you have bought it, okay? Because you just melted it. Now, folks, when you go into a laboratory, and you will this week, um, what you find are a whole bunch of brand new ammeters and a whole bunch of voltmeters that look like they came across on the Mayflower. <laughs> and that's because every semester we have to buy new ammeters because every semester people hook them up wrong and melt them. A voltmeter you can only break by throwing it against the wall. Okay, you can hook it up to anything, you're not going to hurt it. But this, acting like a wire, I mean it's just like taking a wrench and being around a, a car battery. There's places you just don't want to set that wrench down, right? All right? So, when we hook that up, we get a trickle of charge because it has so much resistance. So, please, which has more resistance, an ammeter or a voltmeter? I just gave you the answer. And folks, let me be clear about why I just gave you the answer. In the previous class, I did all the teaching, but I didn't give the answer. When I asked this question with the clickers, it was 50 50, it was as if I had said nothing. Uh, it's as if there had been no lecture. So, do better than that. Oh, perfect. Yes. Uh, these eight will be removed from the class records a little later today. <laughs> okay. uh, now, one last problem, and this will help you with your tutorial homework. You have a one ohm resistor in parallel with a million ohm resistor, and we would like to replace it with a single resistor, an equivalent resistance, that would give us the same current through the battery. Is that equivalent resistance going to be greater than a million, somewhere between one and a million, or less than one? Again, you know the answer. You know the answer. Okay, get your vote in. Okay, the answer is C. Folks, here's why. Watch, this is subtle. You gotta watch. Pow! Okay, I'm gonna show you again. <laughs> Pow! Did I change the circuit? Yes or no? no? No, I did not. But now it's clear that if you're Fred trying to get through this, you can go through the one ohm, or you can go through the trap door. It's not a good path, it's not an easy path, but it's an extra path, and that lowers the resistance. If I use this formula here over here, I would have one over one, and one over a million, right? What's the lowest common denominator? A million. a million. So this would be a million over a million. And that would give me a million and one over a million. But remember, that's one over our equivalent. So the equivalent resistance for this is a million over a million and one. That's going to be less than one. Just a little bit less, but it is less. Less than the least. It will always be less than the least. Okay, folks. It looks like you've uh, absorbed enough information today. I'm looking so forward to Wednesday when you've been through that tutorial. We're going to have fun. We're going to have fun.